So now he finishes 12 and says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and I will now show you the most excellent way. You could paraphrase the end of 12 like this. You should eagerly desire or pursue the greater gifts. Catch this. But in case the pursuit of the gifts causes you to lose sight of what is really important, let me first talk about love, which is not a spiritual gift, but an overarching way of life that provides the framework in which the gifts can and should be used. That's why 13 is here, because he's about to lay out how we should use the gifts in the assembly. And he says, but I'm going to show you the most important thing first, and this is the framework. This is love. And this is where we get 13. Now, if you've been here all week, you'll see that in 13, Paul hits on many of the things that they've really been struggling with. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, remember we talked about the fact that the Corinthians thought they had arrived because they had angelic speech. They were speaking the language of angels, which meant them super spiritual. So Paul hits this right at the beginning. You speak in the language of tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have long, don't have love. All I'm doing is making a noise. So you can be as proud of your tongues as you want, but if there's no love behind it, it's useless. It's a clanging gong or cymbal. Now, some of you probably got drums in your church, or all of you, and you may be not really fond of the cymbals. But I tell you what, if you ever had a guy up on the platform just banging on cymbals, it's hard on the nerves. It really is. You'll get this sometimes after church when the kids go up and they want to practice the drums, and it's just clang, the clang, the clang, the clang. That's how God hears our tongues without love. Clang, the clang, the clang, the clang. Again, now, he's hitting at the Corinthians' favorite things. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries, and I have all knowledge, this is Miracle Channel stuff right here, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, I mean, that's the Pentecostal dream right there. I can prophesy. I know things about people. I can understand all mysteries. I have great knowledge. My faith can say to this mountain, be cast into the sea and to be done. Man, you'll be some popular. I said this week, you get one of them special suits made that don't need a tie. Praise God. <laughs> Woo! Hey, white ones. Right? Paul says, you can have that, but if you don't have love, he says, I am what? Nothing. Nothing. See, Paul was able to put stuff in plain language too, wasn't he, really? Not, oh, that's okay. You got Nothing. And he says, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and even surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. He begins with tongues, which is their problem, and includes, includes other charismatic and self-sacrificial deeds. Then he describes for us how love acts. And if you ever want to know, you ever, I don't know if you've ever done this before, put your name in the place of love here. It's awful. It really is. Do it alone and not with your spouse so you haven't got to watch them laugh. <laughs> but just put your name in the place of this. Love is patient. I've already failed. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered and keeps no record of wrong. It doesn't delight in evil. The flesh does, though, doesn't it? Sometimes there are people that when they trip up, we get just a little bit pleased, don't we? Inside, of course. You wouldn't say it out loud because we're saved and stuff, but... There are people who have been walking around just a little bit too big to suit us, and when they crash, well, we're kind of a little bit happy about that, aren't we? Privately. Of course, it's not private because God knows your thoughts. But love is, does never delight in evil. Never delights in somebody tripping up. Love actually never delights in somebody getting what's coming to them. That's the flesh. Love always rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That's love. 
Love never fails. So now he goes back and he picks up because the Corinthians are very convinced that because these have these spiritual gifts, they must be very spiritually mature people. So Paul's going to pick this up again and he says, where there are prophecies, they're going to cease. Where there are tongues, they'll be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it's going to pass away. We know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfection comes, that is seeing Jesus face to face, the imperfect is going to disappear. When I was a child, I talked like a child, and I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only as a reflection in a mirror, but then, praise God, we're going to see face to face. Now I know, I know in part, and I shall, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And Paul ends with this, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Never mind spiritual gifts like tongue and prof- tongues and prophecy, even alongside faith and hope. Nothing outlasts love. And you know why that is? Because when Jesus comes and we see him face to face, you're not going to need faith. You're not going to need hope. You'll have hope fulfilled. And your faith will be sight. But love will persevere through all of eternity. That's why it has to be the basis for our actions. So the key point here is that without love, we are not spiritual. I'll say that again, Pentecostals. Without love, we are not spiritual. Without love, you cannot be spiritual. William Seymour, I told you this week, the pastor of the Azusa Street Mission, where the revival said, he said, I care not how many tongues you speak. If you have not love, you have not the baptism of the Spirit. care not how many tongues you speak. If you have not love, you have not the baptism of the Spirit. And friends, the reason for that is that the Holy Spirit of God is love. And when you are baptized Him, you'll have to have a baptism of love. And He's saying, you may be able to speak in tongues, but if you don't have love, you don't have the Spirit. Love should abound in your life then. And He does all of this to set us up for chapter 14. So you see where we are. We have a group of people who have elevated gifts, but they're living in disunity. They're living in sin, but they can still practice in the spiritual gifts. They've made one gift to be better than all the others, which, by the way, is tongues, which we've done some of in our own history. And Paul says, that's not what spirituality is. Spirituality is grounded in unity. Spirituality is grounded in holiness. Spirituality is grounded in submission one to the other. Spirituality is grounded in recognizing your body, your brother and sister sat next to you. And spirituality is grounded in diversity, even while we have unity. So he lists the gifts, he talks about love, and now we'll conclude, he wants to teach them how to use the gifts in the assembly. Now you know my experience? I've been paying attention to this pretty close for about 25 years now. And it seems like as Pentecostals, we have some idea about tongues and interpretation, but we don't understand the rest of the gifts very well. And we don't understand very well how they're supposed to actually function in the assembly. Like what's supposed to happen on a Sunday morning if somebody stands up with a gift? So Paul actually walks us through that. He says, anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He speaks mysteries with a spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I'd rather have you prophesy. And here's why. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church is edified. Now, there have been other churches who have read this and said, well, Paul is damning tongues. Paul doesn't like tongues. He says, it's better if you prophesy. And then what they do is they reinterpret prophecy as preaching. So now we're all off the hook because actually what you do is you don't speak in tongues at all. You need prophecy, which is preaching, which every church does every Sunday. That's all there's to it. Not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying tongues that are uninterpreted in the body like this have no value because we're not being edified. So unless you're going to interpret your tongues, then you need to prophesy because prophecy speaks directly to the people and they're edified. Are you with me so far? So Paul's concern is not to push tongues out. Paul's concern is to say our goal 
is not to puff ourselves up. Our goal is to make sure our brother and sister is edified, built up. Okay? So this is the key issue. It's uninterpreted tongues, which is the issue. Because the goal is the edification of the body and not the glorification of the individual. We have in our context over the years had people who regularly, I've heard, I've heard stories, regularly stood up and they speak in tongues in the assembly and you get the sense after a while that this is more about them being seen than edifying the body. This is how they feel spiritual. And you get this impression after a while because you realize there is no interpretation coming behind this. And we've all sat in those types of meetings, haven't we? Where so-and-so gets up and they speak in tongues and now the pastor's there and you know the pastor's trying to figure out what to do. Do I wait for the interpretation, although I'm pretty sure there's neither one coming? Or do I, do I just keep moving? You all been there? I'll tell you what's going on there. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Paul teaches that speaking in tongues is personally edifying to the believer. Quite apart from the sign that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, when you're baptized in the Spirit, we speak in tongues. Right? We believe that. That's a sign that we've been baptized. It's not the point. The point is the soon return of Jesus. That we need power in our lives to witness because he's coming back soon. People are going to be lost. We need power. God gives us power through the baptism. And the way we know we got the baptism is tongues. But tongues was never the point. The soon return of Jesus was the point. The minute we mix this up as Pentecostals and tongues became all about being Pentecostal, we saw a great decline in the number of people speaking in tongues because we lost the purpose for it. It was a sign of our empowering because of Jesus' soon return. Now, when that happened to you, I don't know if you realize this, but that was not meant to happen once. It wasn't meant to happen just around an altar. It was a prayer language given you to pray in every single day. And it edifies you. Paul says it right here. So if you have lost that ability, it's like a river that needs to be refreshed in you. You need to go back to the Lord. You're not being rebaptized, but you're saying, I can no longer pray in this prayer language. I want to be refilled. I want to be able to pray in tongues. We pick this up from Romans 8. Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans or words that cannot be expressed. He who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people with the will of God. How many of you here, you would wave at me to say, I pray in tongues every day. Can you wave at me if that's you? I want to say how common this is. I pray in tongues every day. Just wave at me. Very, very few of us. Friends, this is a gift given by God to you to edify you, but also this is how it works tremendously. I'm very happy to have my friends Edwin and Rhoda here today, pastors in Fort McMurray, were pastors with us. They came all the way just to hear me preach this morning. That's not true, but it sounds really good, doesn't it? But I can know that, that Edwin is, is having a challenge, but I may not know what it is. So I have two options then. The preferred option traditionally in the church is for me to go around and gossip till I can figure out what his need is. So I can pray more specifically. That's not really God's pattern. God's already set up his way for me to do this. I can know my brother there has a profound need, and I don't need to know what it is, because I can pray in tongues for him. And the beauty of praying in tongues, I don't know if you know this, the Bible says, he who prays in the Spirit, prays the perfect will of God because the Spirit knows the will of God. So I can actually pray the will of God for Edwin's life and have no idea what he's going through. I don't have to guess. I don't have to pray, oh Lord, do this for him or do that for him, not knowing what the will of God is, because the Spirit of God knows the will of God, and the Spirit of God prays through me for him the perfect will of God, and I haven't got no details. I can meditate on him, I can, I can set my prayer towards him, because you know when you pray in a tongue, your mind is unfruitful, so to speak. So I can set my prayer towards him and say, God, meet his need, but I can pray in tongues, and the Spirit prays the perfect will of God for him. And that's a powerful tool in the kingdom of God that apparently we aren't utilizing enough. And if you've lost that ability, you need to go back to God for that. My brothers and sisters, Paul says, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be to you unless I bring you a revelation or knowledge or prophecy or a word of instruction? 
since you're eager for gifts of the Spirit, excel in those that build up the church. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind's unfruitful. So what will I do? Paul says, I'll pray with my spirit. I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with understanding. Otherwise, when you're praising God in the spirit, how can somebody else say amen to your thanksgiving since they don't know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but nobody else is edified. So the whole point here is that we should not have uninterpreted tongues in the assembly because we're not, we are caring more about our look than about whether or not our brother and sister are being edified. And so Paul is really taking a crack at what it means to be spiritual. So the key point is that everything must be done for the edification of the body. Our worship together is not about ourselves. Our worship together, friends, is not about us. Let me say again what I said earlier this week. If you leave this service, and we all do it all the time, and we say, well, I didn't, the minute you do that, you've missed the point. I didn't like the song leader. I didn't like his songs. I really didn't like the soloist. I didn't really like what that chubby fellow up there from Tyndale had to say. That would be me. I know I know I threw you off a chubby, but <laughs> the minute we do this and we do it, we pass judgment. We have already asked entirely the wrong question, see. The only question I really need to ask here is, was the audience glorified? And that would be the Trinity. Did the Father receive our worship? Was it aimed at Him? Did the preacher speak the word of God? Was God glorified in the word? Was he glorified in our brother who sang to us, ministered in song? Was God glorified? That's the audience. That's the question. The minute you hear it come out of your mouth, I, we've missed the point. It's not about I. That's why we have so many wars. So Paul says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I'd rather speak five intelligible words to instruct than 10,000 in the tongue. And the key point is that seeking our own glory in the assembly is actually childish. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. And I have to believe if Paul came back today and surveyed some of our assemblies, he'd say the same thing to us. Brothers and sisters, relative to evil, be like infants. But relative to seeking our own glory and puffing ourselves up, and that great feeling that we feel when everybody in the assembly views us as spiritual? Because we have the power, because the pastor's afraid of us. Stop it. And for the love of God, literally, grow up. Grow up. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about Him. That's really the point of 14. This is a really interesting... We have very few pictures. I'm almost done, by the way. We have very few pictures of the early church in progress. Some of you think that the Bible says somewhere in the Greek that we have to have church on Sundays, and it has to be at 11 o'clock and 7 o'clock. And if you move off the holy hour, God himself is offended. We've never had wars over moving the time of church Sunday night from 7 to 6.30. I mean, there's people who have just about tore up their membership cards and canceled their plot in the graveyard. <laughs> Deem that mad. They're going to be buried out in the back garden. <laughs> That's just tradition. You know this. Let me tell you something. When God wanted to make something really plain in the Bible, you've got to work to miss it. It's true. When God wants to make something plain in the Bible, you have to work to miss it. But he says nothing about when we should meet. Nothing. If God wanted us to meet at 11 o'clock Newfoundland daylight time, he could have told us that. But instead he says this, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's about the best you got to argue for your 7 o'clock service. And I can read the Greek in that. It don't mention a time. That's traditions that we fight for. Certainly we've got to have something better to fight for than that, don't we? With a world lost and going to hell, dying all around us, 
with the in the onslaught that's against our families and our children these days, and we got to fight about time of service? Doesn't that strike you as a little bit like we got need more to do? Now, you liked that plain speech and right well yesterday, didn't you? We get caught up in an awful lot of silliness sometimes, friends, with a world that's lost around us. We really do. And Paul is saying that anyone who seeks their own glory in the church is childlike in that sense. Now, this is a picture of the early church, and I love this picture. I don't know what time they met. I have no idea. But he says this, what shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. You get the sense there that the body participates. Sometimes since Paul's time, he wrote this in about 55 and 2014, we all in the church learned that church is about a group of people up here doing something and you all watching. Even what I'm doing right now is wrong. This is way more like a lecture in the world, in the world than the preaching of the Word of God because the preaching of the Word of God was meant to be participatory. I would preach, you would, you would answer. I would ask questions, you would answer back and forth. That's how it was meant to be. And you get a picture in Corinth that that's what's going on. Each of you has a hymn, somebody shares a word, somebody has a tongue, somebody has an interpretation. You get the sense that there's a flow in the body that the Spirit is moving in the body, and different ones as they are moved upon share with the body, and everybody's edified one from the other. That could hardly be more different than the paid professional pastor. The minute our pastors thought of themselves as professionals, we got in trouble. Piper has a wonderful book on that. Everything must be done in the church so it's built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at most three should speak, one at a time, and somebody should interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet. So here's the rules for the tongue speaker. Paul gives two. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret. Because if there's no interpreter, they should be quiet. It's very simple. If I'm here and I'm going to give a message in tongues... I should pray first when I feel that I have this message in tongues that God also gives me the interpretation. So if you see that sometimes, that's perfectly fine. If somebody gives the message in tongues and immediately gives the interpretation, that's great. But sometimes, and this is where discernment comes in, they are to know that there's an interpreter present. Because Paul puts the responsibility back on the tongue speaker. He says if there is no interpreter present, presumably they would know that, then you keep quiet because there's no point speaking in tongues with no interpretation. Now we've seen a lot of abuse of this over the years and we've seen a lot of confusion, but that's basically the way it is. When we have a gift of tongues and we're, we feel to share it with the assembly, we should either pray for the interpretation or know there's somebody there already to interpret it. And if you're here and you're the pastor, you're going to need to pastor this so that when the gift of tongues comes out, you're going to need whether or not this is a saint that got excited in their prayer language and got loud or whether or not there's actually an interpretation coming. So we see there should be an interpreter present. One at a time may speak. Apparently in Corinth, they are going off like firecrackers. Two and three at the same time. And again, this is not good order. So we have them in order. Paul makes it clear that we are to be mature enough to judge what we hear. Two or three prophets should speak, he says, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. If a revelation comes to somebody who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turns that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. They had so much prophecy going on, they had to take turns. And some people prophesied a long time. They'd have to sit down and stop so the next person could kick in. We don't really have that problem much now. But this is a picture of the church in Corinth. So two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. We are to be mature enough in the body... So that when we hear something, we are to judge it. We are to discern it. We feel uncomfortable doing that now, don't we? But some of you, you have done this all your lives and you didn't know really whether or not you're doing it. But all of you have heard a message in tongues and interpretation. And when you got out in your car, you thought, I don't believe that was God. That was like three verses of a hymn, a little bit of King James, Jesus is coming soon, let's go to lunch. We've heard them, right? 
And you get the sense deep inside that didn't really seem to be from the throne. Well, what you're doing there is you're discerning. That's good. You're called to do that. You're not called to chew apart your brother and sister publicly, certainly, but you are called to discern perfectly. You should know when a gift is given whether or not that was the Spirit or not. You're supposed to know that. But have you also heard times when tongues and interpretation have used and sent a shiver down through you? When the message comes forward and you think, I just heard from the throne room. You ever heard exhortation like that? You haven't got to wonder? You know that was God just spoke to us just then. He stopped what he was doing in the providence of the universe and saw our small little church around the bay and he looked down and he spoke directly from the throne room to us. Have you heard them? And you knew it, didn't you? That's discernment. That's what we're called to do. I take three approaches. I teach my students this in the gifts. If you were here this morning and you were to move in the gifts, I, I view them as one of three ways. And if you're here and you're a pastor, you should be making time for the gifts to operate in your assembly regularly. You really should. This is the edification for the edification of the body. But when the gifts come, I, as, as the pastor at the time, have to do this in real time. I have to discern, and I discern it one of three ways. It's either positive, which means I can sense right off the bat, this is from God, this is edifying the body, that's fantastic. It might be neutral. There might be a fair bit of flesh in there, but it doesn't really hurt. It doesn't really hurt to quote a little bit of it as well with my soul. Shall let it go. You may speak to them after, you may not, depending. But you're also going to have to be ready that every now and then the flesh will really take control of somebody and they're going to stand up and try to line somebody up in the body and it's very negative and it's very harsh. The Spirit of God does not speak to us very negatively and harshly through the gifts. The Spirit of God corrects, but it's also always in love with mercy and grace. And when you hear something come across that sounds like a gift, but it's harsh, it's not the Spirit of God. And if it's harsh enough, and it's condemning enough, I sit it down. And I do that because as the shepherd, I am responsible for the sheep. And I can't have somebody coming in and tearing apart the sheep and me watching it. So it may offend that person, and it certainly may offend their extended family, but my responsibility, although I try never to do that, is to guard the souls of the sheep. So there will be times you're going to need to sit some of that down. And that is just the nature of it. prophet is self-controlled. Paul concludes with this. He says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Bear with me just a couple of more minutes. Some of you have always wondered when the spirit moves on you if you're actually in control anymore. And some of you are actually a little bit afraid of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, although the Holy Spirit is the greatest power and force you could ever, ever imagine, he comes into you like a gentleman like a dove. I got a glimpse one time in Newfie Chapels, and my students here from Tyndale can tell you we have had some wild times in Newfie Chapels, but I was praying in the Spirit one night in Newfie Chapel, and God, it was like he hauled the curtain back and whipped it back again for me, and I got the quickest sense of what the Holy Spirit was like. And it's like an all-consuming, awesome power that you couldn't even begin. You would go flat. The Bible says this. They fell on their faces, though, did? That the sheer terror of the power was unbelievable. And I got the faintest glimpse. But yet, when that all-consuming power of the universe comes to you, he comes to you like a dove and a gentleman. And Paul says here very plainly, that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the control of the prophet. And what that means is that the spirit is not going to come in and make you do a pile of crazy stuff you don't want to do. It means you haven't got to go and act out in all kinds of ways. It means that your spirit is in your control, which means you can act in order and in good conduct within the assembly. You have not got to be afraid. So Paul concludes by saying, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues, but every, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Paul hasn't forbidden speaking in tongues, nor will allow, he allow anyone to think he has. And he calls for another, he concludes with another call for order, which is the essential problem in Corinth. 
So I ask you this question. The Corinthians had elevated the gift of tongues above all others. They were using this gift as a measuring rod to determine the spirituality of other believers. Do you think we've ever had anything in common with that attitude? That was the Corinthian issue. And Paul comes back to them time and time again, and he says spiritual gifts are fantastic, and we should be flowing them in, in them, but spirituality is not about how high you can jump, and it's not about your shout. It's not about how you may emotionally react. At its core, it's about how well you love your brother and sister, and how well you love the world that you encounter around you every day. For what business is it of mine to judge the world? God will judge them. And that for Paul is what it means to be really spiritual. That's for Paul what it means to be mature. So he concludes with this verse in chapter 16. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. But do everything in love. And if you want a test for your spirituality, there it is there. Do everything in love.